Good morning. And I uh, just want to say that if you're visiting with us today, that uh, when we're finished with this assembly time, we're going to be uh, meeting downstairs in the cafeteria for a monthly uh, fellowship meal. We eat more often than that, but uh, together we meet on a monthly basis. And we would like to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, we brought extra food, so if you're not a member of this church and you are here today, then we would like you to come down and join us and enjoy that. I also want to remind you that there's a short meeting right after this uh, assembly in room E9. There will be a short meeting of those that are interested in some of the uh, new direction that uh, the Greeters Ministry and the Welcome Baptist Ministry uh, will be taking. Uh, if you're part of that ministry, certainly would like for you to be there at that uh, meeting. And if you've, if you've ever thought about being part of uh, what has traditionally just been a greater ministry here, like uh, or, or you want to be involved in more than just, just greeting people as they come here, you want to be involved in the follow-up uh, with uh, our visitors, then be at that meeting, Rumi and I, with uh, Kate Hines and Freddie Griffith. It's kind of strange, isn't it, uh, today being here with the chairs kind of straight and in, in the perfect line and all that. But uh, I'm glad that we can be here and that we can sing praises to God and that we can open His Word today. And we will be in Acts chapter 4. If you want to be turning there and have that, that ready to go. I didn't, uh, I'm kind of making this up as uh, I go along. I didn't intend for it to be a uh, chapter by chapter by chapter, but that's what it's turned out to be so far. And so we're probably going to go through Acts chapter 8 and not our, our chapter 9. And we're going to be looking at some uh, uh, characteristics of the early church in this series. Today we're looking at uh, the courage that it takes to make a difference. Uh, I think that none of us want to be thought of as a coward. I think that's probably one of the most despised names that you could ever be called, at least growing up, for somebody to call you a coward. We just we do not want to be a coward. We'll do almost anything to avoid being thought of as a coward. You remember in uh, grade school, all of the, the stupid, dumb, and even dangerous things that you would do because someone dared you and you didn't want to be thought of as a, that dreaded word, chicken. You know, and you hear the, <laughs> so we can do all kinds of crazy things because we do not want to be chicken. We do not want to be a coward. We, we uh, really think a lot of courage, those who are courageous. And when you think of uh, courage, probably think of uh, people who are involved in the death-defying kinds of acts like firemen who rush on a, in on a regular basis and, and into the burning building and they pull people out and they save their lives. Or maybe you think in terms of some kind of heroic sacrifice, the, uh, the man who falls on the live grenade to save his buddies or gives his life in some other way. This morning I want, to think, I want us to think about a, a little bit different uh, kind of courage, but courage uh, still the same, and that is the courage that it takes to make a difference in the world. It takes courage to make a difference in the world. Because in order to make a difference in the world, you have to be different. Changed people bring change to the world. You cannot make a difference without being different. You cannot make a change in the world without being a changed person yourself. Changed people change the world. If you you cannot change the world by imitating the world. You cannot change the world by going along with the world. You cannot change the world by just uh, blending in. You have to be different in order to make a difference. And it takes courage to be different and to make a difference. And that's what I want us to, to look at this morning in Acts chapter 4. And uh, before we go any farther, I'd like for us to pray together about this passage. Father, you know that it's not always easy to get a hold of courage. But we do want to make a difference in the world. And we believe that the same power that was available to the early Christians is available to us to help us to be faithful to your calling. 
and that calling of making a difference in people's lives. And so I pray today that you're going to use this passage in Acts chapter 4 to stir your church to the kind of courage that shook the world so long ago. We want that in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In uh, John chapter 15, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. That shouldn't surprise you. He said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. There's that idea that if you're going to go along with the world, you know, no, no problem. The world is going to accept you, but you're not going to really make any kind of impact with your life. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have cho chosen you out of the world. I have pulled you out. I have called you out of the world so that you can make a difference in the world. That is why the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of, and notice my name. The name of Jesus is mentioned a lot throughout the book of Acts, as Jeff pointed out, because the name of Jesus is a powerful name. It's a name that can change lives. It's a name that can bring forgiveness. Well, it wasn't long before the early church realized the truth of these words. And so in Acts chapter 4, we have the first recorded opposition to the preaching of the gospel. The, the church has been uh, rolling right along up to this point, and now they're for the first time going to uh, encounter some persecution, some opposition. In fact, in the book of Acts, after chapter 3, there are only three other chapters in the book of Acts that do not mention oppression or persecution or, or struggle of some form or another. And so, if you'll remember last week in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John had healed this lame man. And this lame man was so excited about his healing that he went walking and jumping and dancing and doing somersaults and praising God in the, in the temple courts. Well, the people noticed that this was the man who had been laid from birth. And they were just flabbergasted. They were astonished by this, and so they gave uh, Peter and John and the other apostles their attention as they began sharing them the explanation for this miracle. And everybody was excited, everybody was happy, except for the religious people, the church people. The church people, the church leaders were very upset. You know, we can't have this cripple dancing around in the courtyards disturbing our order of worship. Come on! And so Luke records for us their, their concern. Let's, uh, let's notice in verse 1. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were great, greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people. You see, you're teaching the people. That's our, that's our place. Hey, wait a minute. That's, that's what we are, ought to be doing. Never mind that they, they weren't, but... They were upset that uh, the apostles were teaching the people. And it was not just the teaching that they were doing, but it was what they were teaching as well. Luke says that they were, they were claiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And so they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But notice verse 4, an unstoppable church. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. By the way, I find that rather remarkable. If you had been listening to some, someone preach and the authorities, the, uh, the, the uh, law enforcement had come barging into the room and had taken the people that you were listening to away and put them in prison, how inclined would you have been to have believed and followed and claimed to be one of them? And yet you see that the gospel message is not going to be stopped. Well... What were they so concerned about? Well, it was not just that they were teaching, but it was what they were teaching, as I have uh, pointed out already, that they were claiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. You see, uh, unlike the, the Gospels, the Gospels record that the primary uh, opponents of Jesus in the, in the Gospels are the Pharisees. And they're opposing Jesus for religious reasons. In the book of Acts, you're going to notice that Luke is much more favorable toward Pharisees. In fact, there are a number of Pharisees who are coming to faith as you read through the book of Acts. The primary opponent in the book of Acts are the Sadducees. And the Sadducees are the theological uh, uh, liberals of the day. Sadducees are the rationalists. 
They do not believe in revelation. They do not believe in supernatural. Reason is the, their source of truth. If you can reason, if you can think about it, whatever that might be, and it makes sense, it makes logical sense, then that is truth. But they did not accept revelation. They did not accept the supernatural. They did not accept uh, the fact that uh, there were angels and spirits. And I find it rather amusing. God, I think, has a sense of humor here in this whole uh, time. In chapter 5, Peter and John are thrown back into jail for the second time. And instead of using an earthquake like he used to get Paul and his entourage out of jail, God decides to use an angel. You know, so you guys don't believe in angels. Okay, well, I'm going to send one. He's going to get you out. And then, the, then you're going to call for an explanation. And all the people are going to be able to explain to you is that an angel did it. You know, there's just a lot of divine humor in this, in this story. Well, the Sadducees did not believe in any of that. They did not believe in the resurrection. And so that really bothered them. And in fact, in Acts chapter 23, Paul finds himself called before the Sanhedrin himself. And Luke says, realizing that the room was full of Pharisees and Sadducees, Paul takes advantage of the situation. And here's some more of his humor. He says, I want you to know, brothers, you've called me to give an account here today. I, I, I stand before you as a Pharisee and, of the, and as a son of a, of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. And immediately there becomes this debate, this heated argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, Paul, I think, is enjoying himself as he's standing there watching these uh, religious leaders fight it out among themselves. But having said all of that, I don't think that that's really the reason why they arrested Peter and John. They, they, they did arrest them because they were teaching, because they were teaching the resurrection. It was something more than that. I think it was the fact that they were a threat to their power, that they were losing control, that they were losing influence over the people. They weren't really concerned about this man. They weren't really concerned about whether a miracle had happened or not. That's never debated. They're not even really concerned about the resurrection because they, they, they really don't even, even debate that issue. They're concerned about themselves. You find uh, this back in uh, John chapter 11. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it says that many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, when they saw what Jesus did, they put their faith in Jesus. But report got back to some of the Pharisees and some of the Sadducees. And so they quickly called a, a meeting of the Sanhedrin. And they said, what, what in the world are we doing? We're, we're losing control of the situation. Uh, everything that we've been trying to do up to this point is really not working. Here is a man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will put his trust in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You see, that's really the bottom line. We're concerned about what this is going to do in terms of our revenue, the stream that's coming in, in terms of our power, in terms of our influence. Influence. John chapter 11, by the way, says that uh, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest of that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all, he said. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? Didn't know that he was being prophetic. One man did die so that the whole nation wouldn't have to perish. Okay? Well, let's go back uh, and pick up our story in verse, uh, in verse 5. It says that the next day the rulers and elders of the, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and they began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Now, I think it's probably obvious you probably recognized a few of those names. So I just want to point out that Peter and John find themselves in front of the very men who just weeks earlier had put Jesus to death. Peter and John are children in the jaws of Jaws. I mean, here is this death squad the movers and shakers in Jerusalem who can easily put them to death just as they had Jesus. I don't want us to miss the courage of Peter and John. And I don't want us to miss as well the, the, uh, the cynicism 
the contempt that the Sanhedrin had for Peter and John. It's a lot clearer in, in, in Greek than it is but in, in English. But they say, by what power or by what name did you do this? In other words, you Galilean hicks, what in the world are you doing here teaching in our place? What gives you the idea? Where did you ever get the idea that you could come in here and do what you're doing? Notice verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Notice. He says, you know, if, if all of this commotion, if all of you're, you're upset over this, this uh, kind of insignificant, in some respects, act of kindness that was done to a cripple, that, that's what you're really concerned about, this, this man here? Well, uh, I want you to know that it was in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he deliberately picks up this, what was originally a slur. Jesus of Nazareth was a slur. And now he's using it in a very proud way to say, Jesus of Nazareth, you do remember that guy, don't you? You, you remember that guy? Jesus of Nazareth has healed this man. The same one that you crucified. And I can't help but think that Peter and John were looking specifically right into the eyes of Caiaphas and Annas. You're the ones who crucified him, but that's okay because God raised him from the dead. Verse 11, Peter begins uh, teaching and sharing Scripture with the theologians. This Galilean fisherman sharing Scripture with the PhDs of the day. He says, the stone you builders rejected, which has become, uh, which has become the capstone. Salvation, verse 12, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now, I don't want us to miss the edge of this. They did not like this message, okay? In other words, Peter was telling them that there is salvation in no one else except in the name of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, salvation is not to be found in the name of Moses. Salvation is not going to be found in the keeping of law, but in placing faith in Jesus as God's Son. That's what Peter said to them, basically. And they didn't like it. And people don't like it today. They thought it was too narrow. But I want you to understand that truth is always narrow. Truth, by definition, is always narrow. Those of you who teach, no, you go into a classroom and you teach 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's very narrow. Someone says, but I, I thought it was 5. That's what, that's what it means to me. And you say, well, you know, I don't want to be a mathematical bigot. 2 plus 2 equals 5. That's fine. No, you don't say that, do you? 2 plus 2 equals 4. There are millions of wrong answers. There's only one right answer, at least in base 10. Okay. That's the nature of truth. And Peter was making it clear that there's salvation in no one else but in Jesus. That seems rather narrow then and now. But that's the message that we've been entrusted with. I read a story this week about a four-year-old that uh, just suddenly started screaming and crying and his mother went running in. What in the world happened? And it turns out that his little infant uh, si sister had just picked up some big toy and just whopped him a good one. And she said, but honey, you don't understand. Your, your little sister, she didn't understand that hurt you. She doesn't understand that that, that causes you pain, okay? So he... Okay. So she left the room and just immediately the baby starts crying. And then she runs in. What happened? Well, she does now. <laughs> well, if the religious leaders didn't know that Peter and John meant business, they do now. In fact, verse 13 says, 
that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And as Jeff pointed out a few minutes ago, an incredible transformation has happened. Here is a man who's willing to stand before the Supreme Court of the Jewish nation and tell it like it is. A man who just a few weeks earlier around a little bonfire with a couple of women denied Jesus not once but three times. And when the Sanhedrin saw Peter, they, 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 they were astonished and they, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14 says, But since they could see the man who had been healed there standing with them, there was nothing they could say. They would have taken action at that point, but there was, there was proof standing right there. I think when Peter uh, realized that they were going to be called before the Sanhedrin, he must have grabbed that lame man by the collar and said, Hey, if we've got to go, you've got to go right along with us. Okay? And so they had him standing there. Well, immediately... They ordered, verse 15, them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. In other words, they went into executive session. In other words, that's translated, what that means is, get those guys out of here because we've got to do some talking and we're probably going to say some stupid things that we don't want anybody else to hear. That's what executive session means. And so they said, verse 16, what are we going to do with these men? You know, how about just uh, believing? For one, that would be easy. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle. Knows that that was never debated. And we cannot, we cannot deny it. But verse 17, to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. I want you to notice that Peter and John had a divine must. Here, verse, uh, verse 18, they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in all of the name, at all in the name of Jesus. I think that if I had been Peter or John, I would have thought, you know, I am not going to stop doing that. But, you know, uh, I'll just keep my mouth shut, live for another day. You know, I'll go about to do that later. That's kind of the way I operate. Well, verse 19, Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and heard. We respect what you're calling us to do, but we want you to know in, in, in no uncertain terms that we are not going to obey this ordinance. There was a divine must about them. There was a message that they had to share. Some people share Jesus when they have to. Other people share Jesus when they want to, disciples share Jesus because they must. Someone pointed out that the early Christians could not be stopped in telling others of Jesus. And oftentimes we cannot even get started. What an indictment. Verse 21. After further threats, they let them go and they decided uh, they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to the people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now, a little point here that I want to make that I think is a big point, and that is that when Peter and John were initially confronted by the temple guard, did you notice that they didn't fight? That they didn't run away? That they uh, didn't resist. They weren't dragged before the Sanhedrin kicking and screaming. And that when they were released, they didn't go back to meet with the other believers and complain and whine. And you don't read anything about this martyr complex. In fact, they pray a prayer. And the prayer is not that their enemies would be persecuted. Or that they would be exempt from the persecution of their enemies. But they pray that God would give them boldness to go back out and do the very thing that got them in trouble in the first place. Notice that. Verse uh, 24b. Here's the prayer. Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Okay? You're sovereign over creation. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage 
and the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And so now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. If this lame man got us into trouble, if, if he became an opportunity for us to preach, then we want you to give us the courage to keep preaching, and we want you just to give us a lot of other people to heal and, and, and opportunities to preach. Well, it says in verse 31 that after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I don't know what to say about that, except that in some way or another, God was letting them know that he was, he was with them. And it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Well, they prayed. They were bold. They proclaimed. They got released from jail. They prayed that they would be bold, and they continued to be bold. Where in the world did they get that boldness? Well, there are a number of places, I think, but you see, uh, they had been prepared for this moment. This was not surprising to them. I want, I want you to, to look over in uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 12 a moment. This is an important tie with what I want to say this morning. Luke 21 is, a, is Jesus teaching about the coming destruction of Jerusalem that would take place in AD 70. But in verse 12, he says, before, but before all this, before the temple, before the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem, the temple in particular is destroyed, they will lay, lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you in synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors and all, and all on account of, again, my name. Verse 13, notice this. This will result in you being witnesses to them. That's, that's so important there. Verse 14, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. But notice what the point is that's made. Jesus prepared them by saying, opposition to your message is inevitable. It is coming. But listen, opposition isn't necessarily bad. Opposition is actually an opportunity. Because when they haul you into the Sanhedrin before these rulers, then this will result in you being my witnesses. And guess what? That's what God wants us to be about. That's what God wanted them to be about. Here's the big point in this, at least for me. Opposition is opportunity. You know, just, just think about it. I think the reason why they did not resist arrest is that they figured that God must have some other place for them to preach other than Saul's porch. That God was uh, sovereign, that God had ordained all of this, that they realized that God is giving us an opportunity to preach before the Sanhedrin. Now, how would that have happened? The Sanhedrin, the Jewish Sanhedrin had several opportunities to hear the preaching of the good news. How would that have happened any other way? You think that Peter could have called up a secretary of the same medium and said, hey, this is Peter here. You know, I am uh, going to be starting this uh, church thing here pretty soon. And uh, before I do that, I'd like to have an appointment with the same medium. You know, could you fit me in maybe 10 o'clock Thursday? No! That would not have happened. The only way it could have happened was the way that God made it happen. God made it happen so that they could put in a message for Jesus Christ. Opposition is opportunity. I want us to say that because I want us to hear that this week as we, as we, as we experience some, some persecution, maybe some resistance, maybe some opposition. <coughs> opposition is opportunity. Can you say that with me? Opposition, opposition is opportunity. opportunity. Again, opposition, opposition is opportunity. How about one more time? Opposition, opposition 
is opportunity. I want you to remember that. Because the courage that we're talking about is not the courage of standing before the Sanhedrin and preaching, but it's the courage of doing the right thing and saying the right thing and all of the little details every day. That God brings opposition and resistance and those kinds of moments so that in that moment we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and we can speak the message for Jesus Christ. There are going to be times like that in our lives or have been times like that. And the only way that people are going to know that Jesus is real in my life, the only reason that, the way they're going to hear a message from God is if I stand up and if I speak up. And so he's calling us to that kind of boldness. It takes courage to make a difference. But it's only different people who are able to make a difference. So here's the, here's the conclusion for us, the application. Number one, just expect opposition. Okay? Expect it. That's one of God's primary ways of getting his message out. That goes with the turf. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. If you ex experience some opposition, then just say, congratulations, somebody sees something different in your life. Wayne Smith said, if you're carrying the ball, then you're going to get tackled. And if you want a little bit of an elaboration on this, some, some, some real humorous elaboration, just talk to Michael Hope a little bit. I talked to him uh, several months ago about what it was like to be a, a quarterback, freshman quarterback, have all the, everybody is cued in on you and everybody's after you, you know. And, and uh, he, he can tell you some really funny things about being a quarterback. You know, if you're carrying the ball, you can expect to get tackled. Jesus said, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in, in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. And then he goes on, you know, one more statement I wish he had not made. And he says, but woe to you when men speak well, all men speak well of you. If you're not encountering some resistance and some opposition and some struggle, that does not speak very well of you. Have you noticed that the world isn't afraid to stand up for what they believe? Have you noticed that? I read a story this week about a man who was on the beach, and he saw another young man on the beach with a t-shirt that said, Stamp out virginity. The world's pretty bold about what it believes. And so he went and, and, and he said, hey, he said, I couldn't help but notice your t-shirt. He said, yeah, this is a uh, really nice t-shirt. He says, well, thanks. And he says, uh, could I ask you a favor? And he said, well, maybe, if I, if I can help. He said, I'd like for you today to go home, take that t-shirt off, wash it, fold it very carefully, put it in your dresser, and keep it. Because he said, are you, are you married? He said, no. He said, well, one day you'll be married, and when you have a, a daughter, and she's about ready to go out on her first date. I want you to pull that t-shirt out. And I want you to give it to the guy that's taking her out. And you think that's, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Maybe the guy is smaller than me. I don't know. That's pretty bold. But it's not as bold as the world. And it's message. And I've got to tell you that the world is becoming even more bold. Which calls for the church to ratchet it up even more. That we have got to be even bolder. If we're going to make a difference in the world. I believe that God is calling us to that kind of difference. And the key to being that kind of person. Is for the Holy Spirit to have control of your life. I want to ask you. When is the last time that you asked the Holy Spirit to have control of your life? God I want your spirit to so fill me. That I will be an incredible witness for you today. No matter what. That's what the early church prayed. Someone says, Dale, that, you, you don't understand. That's just not me. That's just the point. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit that enables you to do that. Every one of us needs to pray that prayer. The Apostle Paul prayed that prayer for himself. And he asked people everywhere he went to pray that for his boldness. Ephesians 6 and verse 20. Pray and ask God to give you to give me the right words as I boldly tell others about the Lord. 
we all need to expect opposition. And the way that we prepare ourselves for that is by being prayerful that God would make us bold. And then secondly, expect God to use you. Don't, don't get a martyr complex. You, you expect opposition, but expect in that moment for God to use you because opposition is opportunity. Okay, we learn that. Opposition is opportunity. Notice uh, Philippians 1 and verse 20. Paul says, I expect and hope that I will have courage now, as always, to show the greatness of Christ in my life on the earth. And sure enough, when God's people, through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, are bold enough to speak up and to stand up, God makes a difference. So that the very things that you would think would be a hindrance to the to the uh, advancement of the gospel actually serve to speed it up. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That's how we can be an unstoppable church. And I've got to tell you that it takes, it'll take a lot of courage. It takes courage to be a Christian. It takes courage to follow Christ. I laugh at people who say that religion is for weak people. Maybe the religion that they have got in mind, but it takes courage to be a Christian. Christianity, following Jesus, is not for weak people. It takes courage to obey Christ when it doesn't make sense. And everybody else is doing something different. It takes courage to be honest when it costs you personally. It takes courage to serve other people. It takes courage to speak the words in love and confront somebody who is destroying their lives. It takes courage to do that. It takes courage to remain sexually pure in our culture. It doesn't take any courage to blend in. Cowards follow the crowd. The courageous follow Christ. That's what we're hearing in the book of Acts. And I've got to, I don't have to give you very many details at all just to remind you that there are not thousands, but there are millions of people in this world today, right now, who are being tortured, who are being persecuted, who are being put to death. Entire villages in Africa who have converted to Christianity being totally wiped out because they're followers of Jesus Christ. And I think, man, I hardly have courage to walk across the street. Well, that's my invitation today. My challenge this morning is that you would dare to make a difference by being different and caring more about what God thinks than what someone else thinks. Because you live your life for an audience of one, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to close this morning by just giving an invitation because I think some of you need the courage to step across the line and make a commitment to Jesus Christ. And that takes a lot of courage. In the first place, you've got to own up to your own sin and your own need for God. And secondly, you've got to repent of your ways and you've got to say, God, I'm not in control of my life. You are in control now. And even if it doesn't make sense, that's, that's the direction I'm going to make for my life. That takes a lot of courage. But I hope today that you're finding the courage to do that. Let's stand and sing.